was talking about this weighted symbolism and the, the lyrics, and I was following him. And then he started talking about ancient Africa. And he started talking about all of the contributions that people of African descent made to the sciences and how we helped to be able to shape science and philosophy and how our contribution in doing so on the African continent was not something that we were discussing and it was very difficult to find tangible information. But he was also very much under the impression that the continent of Africa had highly advanced technological civilizations um, that were not heavily documented and in our discussion of history was not something in, in, in incorporated into our understanding. And I'm following him and you know, I, I always sensed that and those are things that you would hear, but you couldn't always find books, of course, to, to back a lot of this, this conversation. Oh, and then he started talking about hip hop lyrics and you know, very much at the time, you know, Wu Tang was popular and then he started talking about well, oh, Outcast was kind of on the horizon. They hadn't quite turned the Afrofuturist corner at that moment. Uh, he was talking about public enemy and you know, I'm listening and I'm like, okay, I'll follow you. And then he started talking about quantum physics and I'm like, okay, wait a minute. <laughs> you know, what what is the relationship here? I, I felt the relationship intuitively, right? But logically, it did seem like there was a core relationship. They, they kind of reminded me of these circuitous conversations you hear, like in a barber shop, right? At various points. So people talk about one thing, they talk about the other thing, but, but it seemed a little more weighted. And I have a background in, in metaphysics. I grew up in a, a new thought philosophy. The uh, church community I grew up in was rooted in new thought. And New Thought is kind of a Christian-based metaphysics. And so when he was talking, and he started talking about quantum physics, I said, well, have, are you familiar with the New Thought philosophy? He said, no. And then I said, are you familiar with metaphysics? And he said, yes. I said, OK. And so then I started naming some authors. And he had read some of these books. And, and we were able to discuss it that way. And, and my question to him was, what is the foundation? What is the foundation of these things that you're discussing? Because it, you know, there was a metaphysics component, but then there was a heavy Africanus component to it, right? And I, the, the way I learned metaphysics, it wasn't poorly rooted in the Africanus perspective, although we all know that it is, correct? So when he's saying these things, I said, what is your foundation? What is your foundation? Because I was very much raised that you build up. And he felt, to me, it seemed like he was in the stars. And I'm like, bring it down. How do you bring it up, right? And he said, I don't know. He didn't know what the foundation was. And I kept this in, in the back of my mind, you know, as I moved on through college. And the Clark Atlanta community at the time was very much Afrofuturist. But no one was using the word Afrofuturist. Uh, I think about, you know, being a part of the Funk Jazz Cafe which originated at the same time when I was a student here at Clark Atlanta University. So on the one hand, while I'm learning the, what I'm learning about black identity here at school, I would experience black identity in a, a very non-linear artistic way when I would be at the Funk Jazz Cafe because of the way that the music was used to help transcend you. And it was probably, I'm a person from Chicago, so I was used to the, the house music scene. And there was something about the Funk Jazz Cafe where they weren't just playing house music, but they were also playing soul music, and they were also playing uh, funk music, and they were interrelating all of these musical sounds, and then you had people painting, and then you had people dancing, and then you would have some live singing, and then you would have DJs. And at the time, this was sort of unconventional to have all these different uh, interdisciplinary expressions mm -hmm. in one space, right? especially just for a party. And I would go to these events all the time, and it became the sort of thing was like I needed it. I was trained to dance, I grew up in dance, I really loved freestyle dancing. And, but I started to really experience what I would call Afrofuturism through dancing and freestyle dancing, where you have this transcendent experience of identity. And of course, it was really brought home when the, the daughters of Funkenstein were performing 
And they were singing One Nation Under, Under a Group, which I'd heard a million times before. But this time they were singing it, and they were singing it almost like the chopped and screwed version, where they were singing it super duper slow. And it was heavy, heavy bass. And all of a sudden, this kind of feeling took over me, and I realized that, wait a second, they're talking about being one with the universe. This isn't just a, a simple party song. And so, all of that to say, that my experience here at Clark Atlanta University was one rooted in Afrofuturism from the experiential standpoint and from the contemplative standpoint. And I mentioned this particular student as a trigger of sorts, but the reality is much of the campus culture in their pastime was talking about what we, know, what we now call Afrofuturism. I don't recall any mention of Mark Derry. I don't recall any mention of the, the essay, I, I may have read it once. I do believe I might have read it once, but the term Afrofuturism did not stick with me. Later on, I went on to write for numerous magazines and work in film and actively cover black culture. And it wasn't until a couple of years ago when I was talking to a friend of mine who teaches college at Columbia, uh, Columbia College in Chicago, and she was saying, hey, Natasha, you know, I teach Afrofuturism now. I said, well, what's Afrofuturism? And as she explained it, it was very much, she said, oh, it's like Parliament Funkadelic and then the ancient African technologies. And she was literally saying the same thing that the student was saying. And I was like, wait a minute, this is a class in school now? It's like they actually teach this? And I interviewed her because at the time I had just finished a book called Post Black and I had this blog. And I just have to say, post-black is not about the end of blackness, but it's very much about uh, shifts in identity, uh, kind of looking at Gen X and Gen Y, right? And, and what the impact of those shifts in identity could be. And so I interviewed uh, the, this professor, Denise Actum, and I posted the interview, and I started getting a lot of responses. And I was just really curious about this experience of Afrofuturism. And so I reached out to John Jennings, so we speak to you speaking here later this afternoon. Hi, John. Hey. <laughs> and I said, John, have you heard of Afrofuturism? And he said, oh, yeah. And he named various artists and, and different people. And you know, here's the thing that struck me. And I started to get a little annoyed, OK? And, and here's what bothered me. There have been plenty of people who have always contemplated the ideas in Afrofuturism. I can name countless artists, friends, people who were comic book geeks, people who would talk about quantum physics until they were blue in the face, uh, people who love this idea of Afrofuturism, and none of them, short of Denise and John, had ever heard the term Afrofuturism. <laughs> and I thought back to this particular student, uh, this friend of mine, when I was in college, who was having this conversation, and I remember the fact that he and some of the people who were coming out of Clark Atlanta at the time, they were so excited about what we called Afrofuturism, but then when they graduated, they weren't quite sure what to do about it. They weren't quite sure how to apply it. I mean, they weren't arts majors, right? Some of them were, some were English majors, but you know, they weren't into necessarily writing science fiction. They, hadn't, they didn't perceive themselves as creatives. They perceived themselves maybe as intellectuals, and they're very excited about wanting to make a difference in the community. But something about how they understood Afrofuturism was also very much related to conspiratorial theories, right? So, you know, there, so there was this talk about all that we had contributed and all that we had done. And, you know, then there was this talk about why we don't see ourselves in these, these futuristic sci-fi films. But then there was a hint of dystopianism because while they were so enthusiastic about wanting to make a difference, they weren't sure how to make a difference. Because they weren't just talking about community organizing from a grassroots level, they're trying to take it to space. Right? They're talking about themselves being, you know, universal beings, people in a larger universe, and feeling like as a, a person in a larger universal setting, they should be making a grander contribution. And they didn't really know where to begin. And thus, a type of dystopianism, and then also not feeling once they left Clark Atlanta in some respects, that they were part of a larger community of people. Because at the time, many people who were into comic books and quantum physics were kind of keeping that stuff to themselves. They just talked to their two or three friends, they hid under their, their books under a bed, they felt rejected by larger sports culture, athleticism, um, the emphasis on popular entertainment, and didn't know if their approach to blackness was necessarily celebrated and or recognized. 
So I wrote this book very much thinking about the community of people who felt isolated because they weren't familiar with the term Afrofuturism. And I wrote the book because while there have been a number of writings in academia, if you were not rooted in academia, if you were not a person who necessarily went to grad school and were having certain kinds of conversations, you might not run across that term. And yet, Afrofuturism was such a large perspective of black culture, it was something that many of us were highly engaged in. And I realized that Afrofuturism is more than just talking about you know, representation in science fiction. You know, it's more than uh, just a contemplation about the future. It's also this larger quest for identity. Because something that we teach here and always emphasize at Clark Atlanta, and I mentioned this in the book, is that race is a creation. Race is very much created, and we operate in this space, and obviously it was, it was created to justify the transatlantic slave trade, and there were laws put in place, and it was enforced by violence, and we've been dismantling that system, and Afrofuturism emphasizes that race very much is a technology, but when you look about it as being a creation, at some point we have to push past how that system was very much built and the identity that we have developed through that and then push past to a larger sense of self. And so in that sense, Afrofuturism is more than looking at who we are in the context of being people of African descent, but it's also a way of reclaiming the whole, right? Looking at the perspectives that people of African descent have made to humanity, that visionary sense of resilience, and then using that to further uh, help people understand who they are as human beings or who they are as cosmic beings, as Sun Ra would say. This book is my book, Rayla 2212. So in the midst of me writing Afrofuturism, I got so excited about science fiction and the idea of using the imagination to transform your circumstances that I suddenly want to write fiction stories. And much of my background was in writing nonfiction, really cultural studies and aesthetics. And, and so the story about a woman who lived 200 years into the future, who was a war strategist living on a former utopian planet that had very much turned upside down, uh, was a story that came to me. And in this story, she winds up having to find missing astronauts who wanted to travel using their mind but got stuck in space and time. And she goes on a quest. And this quest takes her into different worlds, into different spaces, into the past. And what was so liberating about writing this story, and I have to totally thank the, the coining of the phrase Afrofuturism because it helped to really put a lot of this into perspective, was that this character is limitless. You know, on this futuristic planet, she's very much uh, a black woman as we understand blackness today, right? But I was very much aware that how we see blackness today is not necessarily how it would be defined in several hundred years ago, just like the, the term, of the black identity we now embrace today didn't exist in the way we understand it several hundred years into the past. And so as a writer who very much wrote about cultural studies, to take a character and put them in that context in the future, where you can't totally talk about them in the context of being black because blackness, as I know it, didn't really exist, was like a real stretch in the mind. But I said, wait a minute, I want to acknowledge culture. I want to acknowledge the, the culture, particularly the African American culture of which she was a, a descendant of. I'm speaking of my character, Rayla, here. And so I said, well, how can I do that? And then I started thinking about, okay, if she lives in Obama City, and if her planet is called Planet Hope, and if the name of the schools are after, you know, different gods or goddesses um, from African cultures and native cultures. And, and so this celebration of self, this celebration of culture, could very much be a part of who she was, even if race as we know it today does not exist. What is Afrofuturism? Afrofuturism is a way of looking at the future and alternate realities through a black cultural lens. It is the intersection between the imagination, technology, mysticism, liberation, and black culture. It can be an artistic aesthetic, a method of self-liberation, self-healing, and it can be the basis for critical race theory. 
as an artistic aesthetic, I'm really talking about looking at it in terms of music and, and visual arts, uh, gaming, dance, film. Uh, and there are a host of people who we can point to as examples of that. Of course, there's Janelle Monet and there's George Clinton, and, and I can go on and on. But when it comes to Afrofuturism as self-healing and liberation, it's really about using the imagination to transcend your circumstances. So these stories, and you know, we were talking earlier a bit about utopianism and dystopianism. The whole idea of looking at your life and feeling as if you can reimagine it to be something else is very powerful. It's very liberating. One of the things that happens when people are often uh, disenfranchised or in, in or have some of the experiences that people of color have had in the, the Western modern world, is that the whole concept of the imagination can be hijacked. As if you can only think about things that are presented to you, or as if you were supposed to be rooted into some sort of reality through which you were born. And the, re the, the real challenge becomes to use your imagination to imagine something else, and to push yourself beyond that circumstance. And for some reason, we call that liberating. So, this is not a new idea, you know, that there have been people of African descent, you know, in the United States, not just in the United States, but I'm just going to talk about it in that context, right, um, who have had to reimagine themselves for survival. This was a sense of resilience. So when we think about history, we don't have to think of it as this, this, this past of heaviness. You can think of it as very much the story of resilience, much of which had to do with the imagination. You know, the concept of a person who was enslaved imagining being free, or the person being enslaved imagining another world. That's something that can get someone to another day. Here we are in a very different context, but sometimes you have children. Uh, I'm thinking about certain fifth graders that I spoke to at a school in the west side of Chicago, and their challenge was imagining themselves, imagining a world. I said, hey, what would you like the future to look like? If you could change anything, what would you change? And all, every single child in the class talked about how they wanted a world without violence. And, you know, I'm expecting them to start talking about spaceships and lasers, and, and they're talking about, I wanted, you know, to, to live in a world without violence. And I said, well, okay, I get that. You're telling me you want to live in a world without violence. I said, okay, what does that look like? I had to make a leap there. Because they kept telling me what they didn't want. I was like, I understand that, because they had a very clear visual of what they didn't want. I was like, okay, you want a world without violence. What does a world without violence look like? And they had to pause for a minute, and so I was like, what does it look like? I was like, okay, okay. And they was like, well, there wouldn't be any fighting. I said, all right. I said, because you, you do not experience every moment of your life, you know, with someone cracking you over the head, or hearing bullets whiz by every second of every moment of your life. So you have visuals of what non, a non-violent experience looks like. Take that visual, stretch it out, describe it to me, and tell me how it feels. And slowly they were able to do that. And then after they were able to do that, eventually they started asking other questions about Afrofuturism. And then at some point they said, well, are you trying to say that we can change the things around us? But it took an hour to get to that point because they were stuck on what they didn't want to see. And so the idea of using the imagination to transcend one's circumstance creates a level of agency. How does Afrofuturism differ from traditional science fiction? Well, the time continuum. Uh, traditional, and I don't even, I need to take that word traditional out. Let me just say uh, Western mainstream sci-fi as it functions in, in major motion pictures, okay? and. The past, present, and future are very linear. You know, the past cannot be changed. The past is fixed. Um, the future has some possibility, but it's very much based on what it is you're doing now. There is a very linear dynamic to that, whereas in Afrofuturism, the future, the past, and the present are one. Uh, that's something that I think kind of comes forth in your book, Dr. Evans, it's something that comes forth in my book, Rayla 2212. It's something that you see when you look at a lot of the images, even if you look at the cover of the Afrofuturism book, which John Jennings, wave John, so they see you are, which uh, John created, uh, there's a dynamic in it where you can't tell whether it's the future, it's the past, or it's today. And you, you see this constantly. 
Uh, I'm going to go back to that image just so you can take a look real quick. Look at that image. On the one level, you can say, okay, it's celebrating the, the past, right? You could say that it's uh, kind of representational of maybe some tribal imagery. But on another level, you see how there's a cyborg dynamic to it, which feels very futuristic. And the third eye, of course, is a symbolism for the mysticism piece. Or it could just be carnival. <laughs> right? Today. You know, we don't even have to go that far. You know, she's at Comic Con. But the, the, the point is to look at the, the time dynamic. Same thing with this image. Uh, this image was created by Karan Graham. He's actually doing the cover of the Black Panther comic book series, which is, which is pretty hot. And he took an image, same thing, and he wanted to build it around the concept of an a African mask, and, which for him he felt looked very timeless. He felt that African mask looked unusually contemporary. Yeah. And again, there's this timeless, this dynamic. Is it the future? Is it the past? Uh, and you will see this in a lot of imagery in, in Afrofuturism. Uh, Afrofuturism differs in that race is very much a technology, which we have spoken about. Uh, it was created, and in recognizing that, it really celebrates this sense of agency. Afrofuturism it embraces the fact that mysticism and technology are flip sides of the same coin. This isn't always something you'll see in more, again, not trying to use the word traditional science fiction, but a lot of Western science fiction very much emphasizes that technology is technology and mysticism or concepts of the spiritual world have nothing to do with that. Not so in Afrofuturism. Afrofuturism values the divine feminine. And when I say that, I'm talking about what some people might call goddess energy or really valuing intuition, uh, nature, feelings, looking at vulnerability as a strength. And in our Western society, we really celebrate masculinity. And I don't just mean men per se, but just the masculine aspect of the world, right? Which, if you think about it in a yin and yang perspective, is um, it's this, this masculinity in that sense would very much be defined as you know, the thinking nature, or logic, or the conscious mind, or the three-dimensional. But in Afrofuturism, while it's claiming the divine feminine, it also emphasizes that we seek a balance of the two, which, of course, is always symbolized by the Egyptian Ankh. Sakra is a popular figure who's often referenced in Afrofuturism. Anyone here familiar with Sakra or heard his name? That is so awesome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, that's super. Okay. So as you know, Sun Ra um, very much created a story of sorts or believe that he was from another planet and, and came here to heal the world through music. He believed that music could help you to teleport. He believed that, or as we all know, that we're all vibrations, and if he could create the sounds and change the vibrational vibrations of the world through music, he could help elevate our consciousness and elevate our experiences. And I have to say that Sun Ra was very much rooted in metaphysics in many ways as well. He's now widely uh, embraced as a philosopher. And he is a person probably referenced more frequently than um, anyone else, maybe next to Octavia Butler, when it comes to Afrofuturism because he embraced the fact of this, this masculine and the balance of the masculine and the feminine, and uh, really emphasize the value of intuition. And what's interesting to me about him is that he literally had to reimagine himself as being from another planet in order to create the music that he created in a segregated society and to feel comfortable doing so. Uh, I just think that's a heavy concept that if he had just thought of himself as Sonny from Birmingham, he would not have created any of that music. So he had to literally reimagine himself, uh, unless, of course, he was from another planet, but <laughs> let's merge the two. Let's say he's both, right? Let's say he's living in two different dimensions and he just made those dimensions merge, right? And in doing so, reimagine himself to be able to create an art form. That's how liberating that imagination can be. And just to think about the fact that he wouldn't have created that music otherwise, I think it's really intriguing. George Clinton, who we've talked about, uh, earlier, 
very much using vibrations. If you ever had the opportunity to hear George Clinton perform, he could take three or four songs and stretch them out. And by the end of it, you feel like you've had some sort of vibrational shift. And I'm not talking about using, you know, other forms of, of elevation. I'm really just talking about the music here, right? And just the fact that he was able to do that and then use the space imagery, I think, is pretty intriguing. Octavia Butler. I think what's really intriguing about Octavia Butler is that when people, before people knew the term Afrofuturism, when people would talk about black people in science fiction, she was the primary name that would always come up, come up rather. Almost more than Samuel Delaney. I think because sometimes people, maybe they didn't know or they found out later, and because his writing stretched so many different ways. And Octavia very much explored dynamics of race and otherness without necessarily talking about race specifically. And I think that was really intriguing. Uh, and she was an inspiration for so many women, which is why you have a lot of women writers, black women writers in sci-fi. She's referenced in feminism, she's referenced in Afrofuturism, and ultimately some of her work has come to inspire activists. Uh, and I'm thinking about Adrienne Marie Brown, who's in Detroit, who uses her work to to create emergent strategies, uh, to look at community building, to, she's using science fiction as a basis for real world community organizing and building. You know, how do you build in environments that feel post-apocalyptic? How do you build when you're in areas where you feel there would be no federal services? And, and she's thinking about certain areas of Detroit, but that can apply in other situations. If you look at what's happening in Flint, Michigan, how can you, what sort of relationships do you need to create with people if you literally need to create or find new water sources? These aren't things we always think about because we assume water is going to be accessible forever, and I certainly hope that it will be. But what kinds of, how do you have to shift your thinking? And the fact that Octavia Butler is a reference for that I think is great. Alice Coltrane is just a favorite artist of mine who I had to share with you, who also was very much like Summer on some respects. I don't think there was as much writing. I can't find a lot of video with her actually speaking, but musically, she was very much about using the vibrations of music to heal and pulled heavily from Eastern philosophy as well. Grace Jones, image, you know, very uh, consistent provocateur in fashion, and it's interesting. Sometimes people like to act like her sense of self, or they want to credit her fashion design to other people. Right? And why just act like she just wore somebody's dress and that's what made her bad. And, and the reality is she's another woman who had to reimagine herself in order to transform her circumstance and to ultimately become this artist who we all know and love. And if you're familiar, she recently performed at Afropunk uh, and Body Paint and even Hula Hooped. And that is fantastic. That is fantastic. I think we should all make that a goal of ours. <laughs> body paint. Janelle Monet, who we all know, very much embraces the, the arc android persona. And when people talk about music and Afrofuturism today, uh, in addition to the beat music culture, and I don't have any images here where I'm, you know, I'm looking at Flying Lotus or a King Brit or H Prism, uh, but, but at least in terms of Janelle Monet, she's a visual that people frequently associate with Afrofuturism. And I want to show you this image. This is an image uh, created by, by uh, Carrie James Marshall. And if you look at it, it's an image of a black family in the future, apparently on a space station, looking at the Milky Way through their window. And I think besides the cover of your anthology, uh, Jarvis, that you put together, you don't always see images of black families in the future. This, this image is called Keeping the Culture, and I think it's incredibly fascinating because there's so much embracing of African culture in their fashion. If you look at the art that's in the background, it's Dogon art, it's Yoruba art, and yet it looks like the kids are looking through some sort of um, hologram where they're learning about their past on Earth. And, you know, obviously you see the couple they're embracing, the instruments that the, the wife or mother has in her hand is an African instrument. And I just think it's a very compelling image. This was a poster that was used for the African 
Festival in Chicago a couple years back, and it's an incredible image because it, it depicts the fact that, yes, you can totally move into another galaxy, into another space and time, and there is room to embrace culture. There's a way to find a, a way through which that applies because at the end of the day, we're talking about humanity. And to me, Afrofuturism is very much part of reclaiming other aspects of humanity to help us understand who we are as people in the universe. Um, because there is much disservice. Representations of people in the future and all of these concepts that we're talking about in Afrofuturism Yes, they are a value to people of African descent because it's a reclaiming of seeing yourself in these, in these, in this light, in this sense of contribution. But generally speaking, it's exciting to people, regardless of whether you're a person of African descent, because it's now presenting another portal of information to help people understand who they are and not be limited around concepts of what you're supposed to know and what you're not supposed to know or what you're supposed to engage with or not engage with based on culture. And to me, Afrofuturism just brings that to light. And that's why people talk about it being so incredibly intersectional because it's not about my way or the highway. It's about showing, it's about using kind of this nonlinear reasoning to help us claim this more intuitive side of ourselves as we move forward. And so that's how I see Afrofuturism. That is the experience of Afrofuturism that I very much embraced and had here at Clark Atlanta University. And again, this is a, a great honor to be able to present to you because it, it is a paradigm in a, a space-time continuum. Uh, to be in the same space where these very ideas help to percolate for me is an honor and a pleasure. And I have to, to thank Dr. Jenkins, who is here. She helped me get my scholarship to Clark Atlanta University. I have to thank Ms. Morgan, uh, who was the best English teacher ever, uh, and made sure that we knew how to document things. <laughs> and really helped us to understand who we were and got me into journal writing, actually. Uh, I don't think I would have been so contemplative personally in my writing had it not been you, Ms. Morgan, and encouraging us all to have journals in our pastime. Much like we just found out uh, that uh, W.E.B. Du Bois had as well. You know, he experimented with journal writing on the side to help him gestate his ideas. And I want to thank you, Dr. Evans, for bringing me here. I very much appreciate you taking the time and valuing Afrofuturism and valuing uh, what this experience means for the students and, and me in particular. And thank you, Dr. Taylor, for making sure uh, and, and supporting this event and ensuring that we have the resources behind it. And I want to thank you too, everyone in the audience, because very, uh, I saw John Henry Clark speak on this stage. And it had a big impact on my life. Now, I have no idea if I will ever have the kind of impact that John Henry Clark had. And I'm not saying that me standing here will. But I, what I will say is everything happens for a reason. So if there are any ideas around the imagination or anything that's, that's coming to you, think about that moment when I asked that question to that student. I said, well, what is your basis for this? This moment in this book is very much the answer for that particular question. So sometimes it can be your future self talking to your present self, informing you just as much as your past is informing you now. And, and this can be from a, a lineage standpoint, it can be from a, a DNA standpoint, it can just be from the fact that we're all universal beings, but if you just want to look at yourself as a flip side of the dynamics of you, uh, you're constantly experiencing you. So if ideas are coming to you, they could be coming from your future. And that's something to embrace. Thank you.
this discussion. It is affirming and reaffirming and confirming. We have a few minutes for questions and answers and discussion. Um, just to recap, I think each of you presented, and the, the way that it was presented, each of you presented a piece of um, Anna Julia Cooper's concept of regeneration, right? And so we have um, Du Bois and the past and an understanding of the foundations, particularly here at Parkland University, the foundations of these interdisciplinary, intersectional ideas of uh, time, right? It's a reflection of the past, present with this idea of what are we doing now? What community have we built now? And the future that is non-linear, that is this connection of the past, the present, and the future self in embodied really in what this moment means for you, what you brought this moment here to mean for us. And so just putting those three things together, listening to you, and as I furiously scribbled in my notes, um, I'm taking away from this that a definition of Afrofuturism that is, um, you know, a community of reconstructive, imaginative, and limitless liberation, right? And liberation, we're to understand, is this idea of reclaiming humanity. So just putting the three things that you um, brought to the table, um, this concept of stone soup is always with me, this idea that everybody brings something to the table, this has been truly um, enlightening for me. And so um, we have a few minutes before we have a book signing and reception upstairs. Uh, if we can have um, questions from the audience. And I, I do think is, uh, yeah, let's, let's do the questions from the audience. Yes, the microphone. Mm -hmm. And if you can stand and, oh, right here. oh there is a microphone. Okay. Well, anyway, uh, uh, Ms. Warman, I appreciate that. And uh, you brought a lot of spectrum, uh, spectrum of man for me about the future of what we may be or what we should become or where we should be headed. And, uh, sir, I, I forgot your name. And, and you, sir, Brad, you, sir, uh, really kind of uh, had more science into your, uh, what you were trying to do, uh, more science and technology. Which is, you know, and if uh, I'm a child of the 60s, a little racial front, Black Panthers, right, the 60s, right? And uh, there was always, we, our musicians, uh, long before uh, uh, Clinton and them uh, came on this, they, it was talking about the mothership connection and the science of uh, Lake Sound of Africa, which a lot of people don't know uh, the, the, uh, the right angle, the most building block, or building block of time, distance, and space, formed from the right angle, convinced with simple, a simple thing that some black man came up with was digging a hole straight down way to the sun. Followed by the hole. He was able to do the right angles to, sh to show that the circuit around the world. So these type of things that we don't know, but it's, you know, like I think Benjamin Franklin said, and Malcolm X reiterated, was that the study of future and study of the past was all research. the future, right? I'm kind of looking at it. But anyway, that type of understanding, right? And uh, you let your your name in a minute, but I don't know if you know Kit Bryant. I was a student of hers at uh, UBass Amherst for a minute. But I graduated, I prepared for the street to Boston University. <laughs> but I did it. And I like the thing about the voice, right? Mm -hmm. Even I'm not a fan of the voice, I think Booker T. Washington should have got more play than the voice than the <laughs> argument they had. <laughs> it seems to just change us our way when we all the to society. <laughs> but, uh, but anyway, I, I like to uh, ask, uh, ask you a question. I'm familiar with the Columbia and Chicago, too. Okay. But, but the question I would like to ask is uh, in your research, uh, what did you look at? Like Sun Ra? Well, uh, not Sun Ra, the, the entertainer, but Sun Ra, the god that's created by the Gilgit Emperor, was in, in, uh, in Egypt. Uh -huh, at right. what time, right? And, and, your, and your spiritualism. Mm -hmm. uh, in the 60s, we had a, a group over in Van City called the Black Race Front. And Doc Bryan was the leader of it. He was a, 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 mystic, he was a mystic. And he was part of the Greenboro guys that got messed up during the race. But, but uh, uh, in the mysticism that you're talking about, right, how does that reflect? Um, uh, um, you and uh, us, and how our future can be vibrated to uh, be vibrated to the future. Thank you. Wow. Um, well, I think that when it comes to this quest for identity, right? You know, we are more than our race, more than our gender, uh, and 
more than human beings in one sense, right? We, if you look at your, this concept of a cosmic identity, which Sun Ra talked about, and, and Sun Ra's not the first person to ever talk about that, you know, the, the whole concept in mysticism is that you are a cosmic being, that you are a, a person, a being in the universe, and that our human experience is very much one that's on a three-dimensional plane. So if you're, I think, in that contemplation, in and of itself, right, there's the idea of purpose. Um, but beyond purpose, you know, there's also this notion of interconnectivity. And the interconnectivity of not just our communities in terms of physically how we interact, but the, the deeper probably soul lessons and soul experiences that we are having and having in shared spaces. And I think a lot of the contemplations around mysticism kind of helps to, to provide a language for that experience. And it points to different doctrines where these things have kind of been contemplated. And the reality is there's a great deal of work in that area in metaphysics in a lot of your African traditions, your native traditions, a lot of your pre-Christian traditions, Eastern philosophies, you know, the, there was an understanding of the value of intuition, right? And it's really just in the past couple hundred years where we've been pushed into kind of this logical reasoning box where there's a, a certain aspect of our experience that we just completely shut out. So I think it's probably part of our task as just individuals to see, well, who am I in a larger space, and what does that mean? And I think that's, it's on one level, it's an individual quest, but because we're all sitting here, right, it's a, a community quest. And what path that takes you on is the path that takes you on. Uh, but I think that the, the point in, in talking about the context of Afrofuturism is that just that it gives voice to some of these things that have always existed, and it helps to bring us to some of those traditions or new ideologies that have a, a language for it. Uh, uh, Mrs. Sheffield, I'd okay. like to ask you a question. We've got two people who've got two people lined up for questions. Sorry. I just wanted to add, I think the question of mysticism that is also an important one because it brings us to belief. Right. Um, right, and I think the question of belief in discussions of Afrofuturism, I think we need to think more about it and talk more about it. It always strikes me that we know that Sun Ra denied over and over and over again that he was ever born. Right. We see that in terms of identity, and I think it's absolutely that. But I am, I'm always struck that we don't actually take him seriously. Like we actually don't believe him. So what would it mean to actually take take that seriously? That Sun Ra may have actually believed, right? That that was a belief that he was not born on Earth. To actually take that, and I, I don't mean to be glib about that, but seriously, I think belief matters. And I think like if he throughout throughout his life said he was from Saturn. And I think Afrofuturism Afrofuturism would work. Why not? Exactly. Exactly. So I think Afrofuturism clears a space for us to actually take those things seriously, to take some of seriously in, in many different in many different ways. Uh, if, if you'd like to ask a question the mic is right over here. Okay. Yeah. Hello again. My question is to my question is for Ms. Tasha. Um, my, my name is Justin Tillett again, another again, a mass media arts major here at Clark University. Um, my question to you, um, I am a council member for the National Black Student Union Movement, um, which was created post-Missouri incident, uh, it's University of Missouri incident, and one of the things that we we as council members for the national um, organization talk about is how to unify the masses. I know you brought up when you were talking that um, black futurism is being used to uh, community organization, things of that sort. How do you feel, well, being that you matriculated through an HBCU, how do you feel that black futurism will impact the, the growth and development of the Black Lives Matter movement? And how can black futurism impact and be used as a tool to unify the student body and black people around, I guess? Yeah, I think it's a, a, a continuation of building on what people have always been doing around these ideas, right? 
and you know the, the liberation movements in, in black communities is not necessarily new, as you're well aware. And the Black Lives Matter movement is really interesting because it's in a digital age and it's targeting something very specific. And it's very much acknowledging the, the LGBT community in the process, right? Very openly. That's kind of, I would say, new um, in just the concepts of, you know, how we've addressed navigating these waters. But all of that to say, I think that something that we don't always see. We always see what we don't want. But then Afrofuturism to me is a reminder of what do you want to see and experience? What does that world look like? And the conversation that I hope Afrofuturism sparks is what is this world that we want to see? What's happening in it? And you know, sometimes we get so mired in the struggle piece that just like those kids I mentioned, <laughs> We don't talk about what this world looks like because there's an aspect of us which might feel like it can't happen or even likes the struggle, you know? Uh, and so I think that if, are you willing to let go of the struggle to embrace a newer world? You know? And for some people, black identity is struggle, right? And, and so I'm just hoping that Afrofuturism really helps to expand the, the ways that we see ourselves in that sense. And this isn't to negate struggle or its purposes or any of that at all. But it is to say, okay, great. This world that we're moving into, it, it's not just... Uh, maybe I missed it. I don't know that I've ever really witnessed Dr. J smile. Like, mm -hmm. yeah. ma'am. Oh, ma'am. Ma because your, your heart is so warm. But as Miss Womack was presenting, there was a look on your face that you were genuinely pleased. Oh, yes. And that is a feat, ma'am. <laughs> that is, that is, that is, no, that has just not happened. So this is, again, warming my heart, and I'm so grateful. After the reception upstairs of the book signing, we will have part two with, um, Lisa Yasek, Georgia Tech professor of literature, media, and communication, um, past president of the Science Fiction Society, um, Clinton Fluker, co-founder of Lyft Art Salon, American Studies and an Emory University PhD student, James Eugene, who I love, and when you look at the, fl the flyer and his picture, um, this three-headed yes. fantasticness, man, it's just fan awesome, founder of uh, Neo Art Style Design, and illustrator, digital media designer, and photographer, um, and highlighting the centrality of Atlanta, and I'm so glad you mentioned Funk Jazz Cafe, um, and um, the, um, of course, John Jennings, associate professor of University of Buffalo, whose art is so, so very powerful, and is part of this um, artistic community that will expand the discussion in the afternoon, um, and, that I'm just, again, pleased to be a, just even a witness to this community of people like M. Shindo Kumba, who was the person who illustrated the Chronicles of the Equator Woman, the, um, the book cover that I showed earlier. So um, we will reconvene, and is Joseph Wheeler here by any chance? Yes, Joseph, if you can stand and be recognized. Sheffield introduced us to virtually the large of um, the founder of Onyx Con, yes. which is the largest convention and festival in the Southeast, celebrating the impact, contributions, and presence of African diaspora in the realms of imagination through popular arts. And so, um, every year annually, you know, you've got Comic Con, and you've got you know all of these other cons, and the Dragon Con, and Magic Con, and I'm just making stuff up. But Onyx Con. <laughs> is right here in Atlanta and this, this gathering of um, black Afrofuturists and scientists and, you know, and, and scientific artists, all of those things. So we're pleased to have you here and uh, we look forward to the discussion at the reception upstairs, second floor. Yes, I just wanted to, to thank you for standing up, my professor, my news writing professor. Uh, your class changed my life. 
very much so. It, it taught me how, it gave me clarity in writing, which I, I didn't have before. And so I want to thank you for that. I want to thank you for telling me to take a marketing class, because that changed everything. You, you told me to do that all the time, and I'm sure John Jennings and some of the people here could attest to my savvy at uh, social media. Right, just coming back from Canada and Berlin and everywhere. See, I mean, you, you just you didn't even talk about Berlin. So she's, you know, she's invited worldwide, and we're so glad to welcome her home in this context of this rich, rich, beautiful discussion um, that will be made available. And so now it is time for lunch. We'll convene here again at 2 p.m. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Welcome to Clark Atlanta University. My name is Dr. Rachelise Candy Tate. I am a 20, 2012 alum of the History Department, but I'm also the Assistant Director for the Center for Creativity and Arts at Emory University. So today's panel uh, is actually brought to you in part in the collaboration with the Association for the Study of African American Life and History, and the Atlanta branch was founded uh, just this past September, September 24th, 2015, at the 100th, the Centennial Conference here. And if you look to your, your left, my right, you see the Association for the Study of African American Life and History, founded by Carter G. Woodson and we have an Atlanta branch here. And our president for the Atlanta branch is Moses Massenburg, who actually is in D.C. right now with President Obama, President and Mrs. Obama. So I am bringing greetings from the Atlanta branch on his behalf. So welcome. Thank you. You should have some literature that we've passed out, some information on the Atlanta branch. Outside at the, as you enter, there's information on our March Phenomenal Women walking tour of Auburn Avenue, so we hope you'll join us there. And this evening at 6 o'clock, from 6 to 7.30, we'll have our first business meeting of the year uh, to tell you some of the things that we have planned, to ask your advice and collaboration and assistance in doing some of the programs and making sure that black history, African American history, African diaspora history, is uh, presented and promoted 365 days a year, not just during February. I want to take a moment and also acknowledge our bank partners who are here from PNC. So, of course, being a nonprofit in the state of Georgia, you've got to have a bank account. You've got to be about the business. And uh, Ms. Myla and Kelton, would you stand, please, and, and be acknowledged? their efforts. So without further ado, I would like to call our attention to this afternoon's panel session, which is entitled New Sons, a Celebration of Black Speculative Arts. And on our panel today, we have, and I'm going in alphabetical order, uh, Clinton Fluker. You raise your hand so they know it's Clinton Fluker. And Clinton is the co-founder of Lyft Art Salon. Uh, which is an organization dedicated to bringing emerging artists, professionals, and social activists together to foster solutions for some of Atlanta's most pressing issues. He's a PhD candidate in American Studies at Emory University. He's also the edit editor, editorial assistant for Southern Spaces, and he also uh, works on a blog for the Rose Marble Library over at Emory University. Clint Fluker. Is, uh, Eugene James is supposed to join us, uh, so I'm going to read his bio and hope that he uh, comes in shortly. He's a native of Elizabeth, New Jersey, and is founder of Neo Art Style Design. He's a um, Graduated from New York School of Fine Art and Industry, and he's he illustrated his first book. Um, just shortly thereafter, it was a children's book with, of over 100 inventors. He received a fellowship from the New Jersey Council of the Arts, and then when he graduated from Atlanta College of Arts, he's been mostly doing uh, illustrations in the Southeast, so we look forward to him joining us.
Next we have um, Lisa. Yes. Yes. Lisa Yazik. And Lisa Yazik is professor and associate chair in the School of Literature, Media, and Communications at Georgia State, Georgia State, Georgia Tech. I was going to get that right. Um, at Georgia Tech, and she's the past president of the Science Fiction Research Association. Her areas of interest are science fiction, cultural history, critical race, and gender studies, and also science and technology studies. She's written in Galactica Suburbia, Recovering Women's Science Fiction, which came out in 2008. And she's co-editor of a collection that includes configurations, which is a double issue on science fiction about the author Kim Stanley Robinson that's coming, uh, that was done in 2012. Her forthcoming anthology is called Sisters of Tomorrow, The First Women of Science Fiction, which is due out this year, so we're looking forward to that. And then our featured speaker for uh, this afternoon is John Jennings. And John Jennings is an associate professor of art at the University of Buffalo. He researches and teaches, and his focus is on analysis, explication, and the disruption of African-American stereotypes in popular visual media. His research is concerned with the topic of representation and authenticity, visual culture, visual literacy, social justice, and design pedagogy. He is a renowned designer, curator, illustrator, cartoonist, and award-winning graphic novelist. So we love to welcome John Jennings. So they're going to come up and speak in that order, but I'm going to take a, a point of personal privilege and say what an honor it is. I was in Chicago for an Asala conference in this past September, and I was at the Southside Community Art Center as an art historian, um, finally seeing the place that I had talked about in my dissertation. And there was a um, Turtel only was had an exhibit at the Southside Community Art Center and had two friends coming to see him there. And lo and behold, it's John Genes and Natasha. Um, and, and as they say, the rest is history. We call up Dr. Evans while we're there in the in the Southside Art Center, and that's how this conference came to be. So without further ado, I'd like to bring up Plant Fluger. Thank you. 